Good morning. This is Thy Strong Word. I'm Pastor Steve Shave, LCMS Director of Church Planting and LCMS Director of Urban and Inner City Mission. I am sitting in this morning for Pastor A.J. Espinoza, and as always, we will be reading the Bible together, and we'll be going book by book and chapter by chapter. This program is underwritten by Lutheran Heritage Foundation, and you can find them online at lhfmissions.org, lhfmissions.org. A brief overview today uh, of our text. It's a, a challenging chapter that we're going to be looking at. It's Isaiah chapter 34, and the typical title for this is Judgment on the Nations. And it is a bit of a difficult text in that it is very law-laden. It is uh, the freeing of God's people, of Zion, of Israel, and yet at the same time it is judgment being placed uh, on the nations who have captured them, exiled them, um, and now we will see the full judgment of of God here in chapter 34. But also, um, we will take a look at how God redeems his people. Joining us uh, for our study today is Pastor Warren Worth of Good Shepherd Lutheran Church in Arnold, Missouri, who is also the KFUO Church of the Week. Good morning, Pastor Worth. Good morning, Pastor Shave. One of my favorite pastors in the St. Louis area, so very, very <laughs> well, glad. <laughs> thanks so much. You know, we, we, we're glad to know you as well, you and your family. Uh, we, we love you all and uh, pray that everybody's doing well. Yes, yes. Yes, very good, very good. So just we we're just down the street and uh, have a special place in our hearts for Good Shepherd. So thank you for being the the Church of the Week. You too, our listeners, can join us in this exploration of God's Word. Uh, you can give us your questions either via email at kfuo at kfuo dot org, or you can call us at three one four eight two one zero eight five zero or one eight hundred seven three zero two seven two seven so with that we're going to jump right into god's judgment on the nations isaiah chapter 34 but i do think that we need to understand the context uh it's would obviously be very shocking just to jump into chapter 34 and hear of this wrath of god without understanding what the context is behind it so you have to take a step back into Isaiah chapter 33 where you see God speaking of the nations as being destroyers and not only that but God has used this uh, for his own purposes and that he will even use nations as destroyers to lead his people back in repentance and so we see that God uses the nations uh, for bringing punishment he raises up even evil rulers as punishments for the sins of his people. But the people of Zion, even though they are being led back to God, they are being brought to repentance, it it speaks of these people of Zion as waiting, waiting in the faith. They are trusting that God is going to be their arm of salvation every single morning, even in the midst of uh, this despairing moment. They know that God is a good and gracious God, and so they wait upon him uh, in this day of trouble. So God then is going to rescue his people, um, and as we're going to hear that this nation specifically being spoken of is is Assyria. So, uh, as Luther would point out, that God's going to rescue these people of his from Assyria, we'll see in the next chapter. So that's a bit of the context, why we see this judgment that's happening. And yet at the same time, we see this promise. So this promise is going to come before their eyes. They're going to see the the king of Israel. It's a message uh, for the nation of Israel that is messianic. Um, it speaks to this beautiful uh, king of Israel, beautiful in salvation. It speaks of this beautiful new Jerusalem that is to come. It speaks of how they will uh, have this untroubled habitation. So they, they live in the midst of troubles, and yet there will be an untroubled habitation. They will, uh, again, as you think of their exile, one day again be in this immovable tent. And not only that, it talks of this life-giving water that flows so freely that it's almost like a river. 
And so for even the least and the weakest uh, and the most marginalized of the people of God, it speaks of how God will care for them. So here you have that kind of juxtaposition of God fulfilling his promises to his people, and yet at the same time, we're going to dive uh, deeply into what that means uh, to be under God's judgment. So with that, Pastor Worth, are you ready to start taking a look at chapter 34? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> okay. So I'm just going to, I'll go through the first few verses and give you a chance to, to reflect on that, if that's okay. Um, Surely. The first few verses in Isaiah 34 say, Draw near, O nations, to hear, and give attention, O peoples. Let the earth hear and all that fills it, the world and all that comes from it. For the Lord is enraged against all the nations and furious against all their host. He has devoted them to destruction, has given them over for slaughter. Their slain shall be cast out, and the stench of their corpses shall rise. The mountains shall flow with their blood. All the host of heaven shall rot away, and the skies roll up like a scroll. All their host shall fall as leaves fall from the vine, like leaves falling from the fig tree. Wow, Pastor Worth. <laughs> yeah, here we go. Yeah. <laughs> I was, I, I, first of all, I was going to tease AJ because the last time I was on with him, we were in chapter 28, and that too was a, a chapter full of God's wrath and woe <laughs> and judgment. And I was going to say, I think we, we've got a problem here. I want to, I want to talk some gospel. The law guy. But, but yeah, yeah. And, and the other joke I was going to make, and by the way, he's in our prayers, I understand that he went to the hospital. So right, right. may the Lord be with him and grant him healing. Amen. Uh, uh, the other thing I was going to tease him about is that we're going to rate this R for <laughs> violence because very, very graphic yes. uh, and uh, impressive imagery here that God gives us because God's law is serious. And I think in a day and age when sometimes we take sin lightly mm -hmm. and don't think seriously about God's holiness and his well-deserved anger against our sin and disobedience, this chapter certainly would be very sobering for all of us as we hear God uh, speaking with a judgment to the nation. So he's calling all nations to hear, to draw near, and to give attention to him. The whole earth is to hear all that fills it, the world, and all that comes from it. The Lord, that is Yahweh, is enraged against all the nations, furious against all their host. He has devoted them to destruction. So here we have this technical term, harem, in, uh, in Hebrew there, which is something devoted to destruction, devoted to the Lord, but for destruction, as were the Canaanite peoples. You know, so when God was bringing his chosen people out of captivity in Egypt and brought them to the promised land, and he said that he would drive out the Canaanites, and that the people there were harem, they were to be uh, devoted to destruction, so that you, they weren't to compromise, the Israelites were not to compromise with the Canaanite people, uh, like uh, coming to uh, Jericho, and for instance, you know, you were to destroy everything. Mm -hmm. uh, and this was, you know, it's a, a difficult concept for 21st century Americans uh, to grasp, because you know, it was as if People want to sit in judgment of God mm -hmm. and condemn him for being too harsh, yeah. that his judgment is too strict. And the idea of what would come across to us as genocidal destruction of these disobedient, unbelieving, impenitent people, uh, it's, to us seems extreme. And yet, I guess we, we need to understand the full extent of God's holy law mm -hmm. in order that we may also appreciate the wonderfulness and the sweetness of his precious gospel, uh, by contrast. Which we will that, get to, listeners. Don't, uh, hold on, hold on. We will we'll get, we'll get there. <laughs> We're going to get there. But right here, we, yeah, right, the, we, we can't pass over too lightly or too quickly this idea of utter destruction. Yes, yes. Completely be given over to slaughter. And again, uh, God, through his holy prophet Isaiah, does not uh, mince words at all. You know, he mm -hmm. talks about being totally given over to slaughter, they're slain, cast out, the corpses heaped up, their stench shall rise, the mountains flowing with blood. Uh, you know, that, that's a very dramatic picture, very grotesque, 
describing a horrible, horrible battle with, with all these corpses. And then when you get to verse 4, you realize that we're not just talking about ordinary earthly warfare, such as often happened in the Middle East, but now we realize we're actually being taken to the end. Mm -hmm. So this is eschatological, that is, it takes us to the end, the last judgment, the end of the world, because when he talks about all the hosts of heaven rotting away, the skies rolling up like a scroll, Mm -hmm. all their hosts shall fall as leaves fall from the vine, like leaves falling from the fig tree, we realize that's language that the New Testament picks up on. It's language similar to some of the other prophets like Joel talks about the sun becoming dark and the stars falling, and then Jesus himself in uh, his eschatological discourses, such as Matthew 24 and so forth, where he talks about the end of the world, Jesus himself talks about the stars falling from the sky, and and in the Revelation to St. John, there too we have this image of the heavenly bodies uh, falling from the sky and the sky itself being rolled up like a scroll, Mm -hmm. a very dramatic thing. So what you see is The present creation, contaminated as it is by mankind's sin, uh, dissolving and and making way then for the new heavens and the new earth, the home of righteousness, as God renews his creation. But before you get to the renewal and the new heavens and the new earth, the home of righteousness and the wonderful stuff that we'll get into in chapter 35 which I don't get to talk about, but the next speaker will will get to talk about that. There you'll have that wonderful gospel. But here you see these uh, amazing evidences in the created world, especially in the cosmos, in in the uh, heavenly bodies, uh, as God has brought us to the end. So just as when you are reading the Revelation to St. John, uh, even as you're listening to the words of our Lord Jesus talking about the end of the world, that's what Isaiah is presenting here, the last judgment, God bringing judgment on the world because of the sin of the world and the uh, present heaven's disappearing right. in this very dramatic fashion. Right. So, very good point. Um, this this is very applicable to us and our witness to the world today. We realize that uh, there will be many who do not like this picture of God. of God. For many people, their image of God is, well, made in the image that they want, but it is a God of love apart from justice. And that's a very dangerous view of who God is. And it becomes love as God versus God being love. So they don't like this picture of a God who is just, who has this wrath against sin. And yet, what does this begin with? It is pay attention. You know, it is hear this, peoples. That is that is our witness to the world around us. You need to pay attention. You need to give ear. You need to draw near and listen to what I'm about to say. And then it does proceed to talk about, as you said, this isn't just for the people of that day. This is pointing us to the cosmic destruction, uh, the end of the ages. This is talking about Judgment Day. Um, and so when we hear about this slaughter and wrath and we'll talk about more i mean just that that image i mean it's saying draw near and and look at this can you even imagine what it will look like when the stars are falling out of the sky the same way when you go outside in the fall and the leaves are coming off the trees and today the lord is certainly here in the st louis area giving us a very (laughs) vivid image of that we've had some cold weather here lately and some rain and now the leaves are falling like rain off of the trees very much as as this is picturing the heavenly host falling from the sky so yes yes, god is trying to get our attention and as you pointed out as this beginning with this here draw near give attention O peoples the day of grace has not yet ended but the warning here is that day of grace will come mm-hmm. to an end. Yep. Uh, God's uh, long-suffering, God's patience will not wait forever. He is patient, not wanting anyone to perish, desiring that all should come to repentance. That's why this law is being preached so sternly here, to bring sinners to repentance before it is too late. Because once the judgment descends, once the sword of the Lord and the day of the Lord uh, descend here, uh, yeah, then it's too late. Judgment day is too late. You don't get a, a second chance. You know, some right. some movies, even by certain Christian denominations re- regarding uh, end times scenarios, um, 
and uh, you know the Left Behind series and some of that might leave one with the impression that you don't have to believe now because when you see certain things happening, such as the rapture, then you'll have a second chance, and that's a very dangerous teaching because Scripture does not talk about getting a second chance. When the day of the Lord comes, it'll be too late then nice, to nice. to uh, repent. So that's why the prophet says so sternly here: give ear, give yeah. attention, pay attention because God's wrath is coming, yeah. and uh, when it comes, it will be of cosmic proportions, and uh, it'll be uh, a very serious and woeful day yeah. to those who do not repent and do not give heed to the Word of God today while they have that opportunity. Yes, that's a good point. The, all, all of the language here has finality, um, being devoted to destruction, given over, Slain cast out, stench of corpses rising, mountains flowing with blood. Um, this is all language of finality in the in the last days. And we'll talk about what that means for us and our witness to the world and the importance of us um, calling on the nations and the world and, and unbelievers um, to take heed uh, to these words and the finality um, that Judgment Day does does bring. So let's take a look at a, a few more verses here, um, getting a little bit more into uh, the, the judgment that's going to fall upon the nation. So we'll take a, a look here, at, starting at verse 5. For my sword has drunk its fill in the heavens. Behold, it descends for judgment upon Edom, upon the people I have devoted to destruction, the Lord has a sword, it is sated with blood, it is gorged with fat, with the blood of lambs and goats, with the fat of the kidneys of rams. For the Lord has a sacrifice in Basra, a great slaughter in the land of Edom. Wild oxen shall fall with them, and young steers with the mighty bulls. Their land shall drink its fill of blood, and their soil shall be gorged with fat." Pastor Worth, what do you see here in terms of this imagery as it speaks to the animals? Okay, well, you have, we've had battle imagery and the sword, but it's moving into sacrifice and the language of sacrifice. So uh, my sword has drunk its fill in the heavens, so God's anger is is full here. And so now that the sword of the Lord, which is a picture of, of the execution of his wrath upon the sinful and the disobedient and the impenitent, uh, that sword is now descending for judgment upon Edom. Now, interesting that Edom and Basra are mentioned here. Edom was sort of one of the perpetual enemies of God's people, Israel. Edom, when you look at a, a map of, of Bible lands, is sort of to the south, southeast of the Dead Sea. And, uh, and so... Uh, from the days of Moses to the days of King David, uh, you, you know, there was always warfare there and uh, continual uh, hostility uh, of the people of Edom against the Israelites. And uh, so here, the, they're mentioned, and Basra would be sort of their chief city, uh, so somewhat 20 miles or something like that, southeast of the, the Dead Sea. So uh, Basra, Edom, they are representative, and in, in, in the kind of a metaphorical use of this here in this text, of all the people who are hostile to God, all the people throughout the history of the world who have been hostile to God and God's faithful people and hostile to God's promise, who have rejected the gospel and uh, reject gospel people and have made war against them, made life difficult for them, have persecuted them, and, 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 and raged against them. Now God's wrath descends on them for judgment. And again, we have these people devoted to destruction, just as the Canaanites were devoted to destruction here, too, the idea of people devoted to utter, complete destruction. Yahweh has a sword, sated with blood, gorged with fat, the blood of lambs and goats. So here, the, you know, the words of lambs, goats, rams, bulls, steers, you know, we're, we're talking the language of sacrifice, mm -hmm. animals that would have been sacrificed in the temple in Jerusalem. And, and now, you know, God is kind of 
turning us all around so that instead of what once would have been animals sacrificed uh, so that people wouldn't die, right? God had instituted the temple worship and the sacrifices and the priestly system in the Old Testament as a picture of the coming of Jesus, as a something that would show the need for a substitutionary sacrifice so that the people who deserved to die a bloody death would be spared and the animals would die as a substitute, you know, ultimately pointing forward to Jesus, who is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, Jesus, who is our substitute, and the wrath of God fell on him, so it doesn't fall on us. He paid for all our sins. It is finished. He is risen from the dead. Hallelujah. And now we're forgiven because of all that Jesus did as the atoning sacrifice for us. Now, in this passage in Isaiah, it's Okay, so you rejected the gospel, you rejected my grace, you've been stubborn, impenitent, and hateful, now here's what you get then. So if you reject the forgiveness of sins that's found only in Jesus, only in the gospel, then you get wrath. And so like so many sacrificial animals, the sword of the Lord is descending on people, all the wicked of the world, here pictured particularly as the Edomites, but again, thinking of the Edomites as representative of all those who throughout the history of the world have hated God, hated God's people, and rejected the gospel. They will be like animals sacrificed. And so again, very vivid graphic imagery, blood and fat, uh, the the organs of the kidneys and and so forth, uh, again, piled up. The land shall drink its fill of blood. Their soil shall be gorged with fat. So it's a very gory picture of the anger of God against sinful, impenitent, unbelieving people that have been hostile to God and hostile to God's people to the utmost. And if they remain in their impenitence to the end, to the last judgment day, this is the fate that awaits them, according to the prophet. Right. And if we're going to see this continual pattern here of law and gospel, even Previously, when we were talking about God's wrath striking down in a bloody way, when we think of, here we have all the sacrifice that's being made uh, that we know represents the atonement of sins, the land soaking up the blood in Golgotha, Um, we're going to see a continual pattern of the building, destruction, building, creation, anti-creation, new creation. So we're going to see throughout Isaiah 34, again, this we do see a vivid picture of God's law here, but it is also pointing us to the gospel, because we know ultimately the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We know that place where the blood uh, soaked up in the, in the ground, and that was there at the cross. And we do know that all of God's wrath was placed upon his own Lamb of God uh, on the cross. So, we're and, gonna... and that and that at the place is striking, is it not? When you read the Gospels, where did Jesus die? But on Skull Hill, yeah. the place of the skull. Right. And so, when you look at at religious Christian art from uh, the Reformation onward and so forth, often you know there are very graphic images that the painters paint of the crucified Lord Jesus on the cross and his blood pouring out of his sacred veins and, as you said, being soaked up by the soil there. And often at the foot of the cross there's a skull, as well as, of course, then uh, uh, the mother of our Lord and and St. John's and uh, the other Marys there gathered at the the foot of the cross. But, you know, that's a very striking image because we realize we were the ones who deserved that death. We were the ones whose blood should have been poured out. We were the ones whose fat should have been spilled out and whose guts should have been spilled out. And yet the Son of God was willing to die for us to spare us, that we might have the forgiveness of sins by God's grace through faith in Him. So think of all the great Lenten hymns, like, O Sacred Head Now Wounded, and think of that as the obverse of this very striking picture of God's wrath and judgment that we've just read. Very good. So we're studying Isaiah 34 today with uh, Pastor Warren Worth of Good Shepherd Lutheran Church, Arnold, Missouri, our KFUO Church of the Week, and we'll be back after our break.
Jesus, the Good Shepherd, says, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life. We invite you to join us as we listen to the voice of the Good Shepherd and follow him who gives us eternal life. Sunday worship services are at 9 a.m. Sunday school and Bible class are at 1030. Good Shepherd Lutheran Church, 2211 Tenbrook Road, Arnold, Missouri, on the web at goodshepherdarnold.org. The Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, on behalf of Concordia Plan Services, Lutheran Housing Support Corporation, Concordia University System, Lutheran Church Extension Fund, the LCMS Foundation, and Corporate Synod, daily reaches out to our members and partners, working together to support our local, global, and international ministries, church workers, and LCMS initiatives at large to carry the mission forward and to serve each other in love. Opportunities to serve, lcms.org slash careers. Welcome back. Welcome back to Thy Strong Word. I'm Pastor Steve Shave. Good to be with you today. And our guest today is Pastor Warren Worth of Good Shepherd Lutheran Church in Arnold, Missouri, the KFUO Church of the Week. Today we are studying Isaiah chapter 34, and you can join us in this exploration of God's Word with questions. You can either email us at kfuo at kfuo.org, or you can call us at either locally here in St. Louis, 314-821-0850, or also at 1-800-730-2727. So here we are talking today about God's judgment against the nations and how this also points us as God's witnesses today uh, to speak uh, his law to the nations and to lead people uh, to repentance and forgiveness as we look at the very reality that is to come in the day of judgment. So we're going to be picking this back up. Uh, We stopped at verse 8 and let's take a look at the next few verses here. For the Lord has a day of vengeance, a year of recompense for the cause of Zion. And the streams of Edom shall be turned into pitch, and her soil into sulfur. Her land shall become burning pitch. Night and day it shall not be quenched. Its smoke shall go up forever. From generation to generation it shall lie waste. None shall pass through it forever and ever. But the hawk and the porcupine shall possess it. The owl and the raven shall dwell in it. He shall stretch the line of confusion over it and the plumb line of emptiness. Its nobles, there is no one there to call it a kingdom, and all its princes shall be nothing. So, Pastor Worth, we see a lot of things unraveling before our eyes here in this day of judgment that it speaks of uh, as it talks of the Lord having a day of vengeance and a year of recompense for the cause of Zion. What do you think of this day of vengeance and year of recompense for the cause of Zion first? Once again, we're looking at at the last judgment is what this is really uh talking about. Uh, So vengeance, we're not talking about in the sense of human beings who are sinful, just trying to get even with somebody who uh, does them dirt. You know, the Lord is the holy and righteous judge. He is the creator of all. And, you know, it's when he judges, he judges righteously. So the day of vengeance here certainly involves the righteous judge coming in judgment Likewise, the recompense for the cause of Zion, that's an interesting expression, is it not? Zion here being a picture for the people of God. So Zion, uh, 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 elevation, a a mountain or or, uh, elevation here connected with Jerusalem and the temple then becomes ultimately a word that's synonymous with Jerusalem and Jerusalem as synonymous with the people of God. And so it's the people of God who have been throughout history, attacked by the unbelievers, mistreated, uh, captured, 
persecuted by them. And so when it says the Lord has a day of vengeance and a day of recompense for the cause of Zion, God is defending his holy church and his holy people, the believers, those who trusted in Jesus, uh, both Old Testament people trusting in the promise of the Christ who is to come, and we New Testament people of God who know that Jesus of Nazareth is the promised Messiah, the promised Christ, the Savior. And so all the people of God throughout history who have been abused by the unbelieving world, God's judgment falls upon them. And once again, we return in verse 9 to Edom, once again um, serving as a picture of, as a representative for all the unbelievers throughout history who have attacked and abused God's people. And so here again, a very strong uh, judgment picture that reminds us of Sodom and Gomorrah. Mm -hmm. So when you have pitch and soil of sulfur Mm -hmm. and the the night and day, uh, it shall not go, it shall not go out. The fire will not go out. The smoke goes up forever. You think of Sodom and Gomorrah in, in the book of Genesis when Abraham looked after God rained down fire and brimstone on the disobedient people of Sodom and Gomorrah, the smoke went up like a furnace. And the New Testament also picks up on this language. Uh, in the Revelation of St. John, when you come to uh, the, the Last Judgment and, and the unbelievers there too, uh, night and day, the fire is not quenched, the smoke goes up forever on the unbelievers who have... Uh, rejected God and and rebelled against Him and refused to repent and have continued their hatred toward God and their hatred toward God's people. This is the judgment. It's a picture of hell, mm-hmm. uh, the last judgment, the fire that never shall be quenched uh, from general. And then you know, thinking even in the temporal sense, you know, when, when Jesus has his eschatological discourses in the Gospels, often you have a mixture of. Jesus talking about the destruction that came upon Jerusalem in the year A.D. 70, when the Roman general Titus came in and literally destroyed Jerusalem, but also then with that, pictures of the last day and the final judgment. Those, uh, there's kind of the near-term and the long-term imagery that gets kind of mixed together in some of those eschatological discourses. And here, too, uh, if someone were to think of the judgment that came upon the literal country of Edom— in the days of Isaiah and Jeremiah and the prophets, they too did experience judgment, and the land is certainly a wasteland. That area by the Dead Sea and south of the Dead Sea is a pretty desolate place. And here it's pictured as being desolate forever, and not just as a spot on earth that that is desolate, but again, a picture of God's judgment, the people that once this land was flourishing, there was a kingdom there, when verse 12 mentions the nobles, and the kingdom, and the princes, it was a monarchy, but apparently the, the nobility elected the king there, but with a country that's so destroyed that there aren't any people left, and what once was a, a place where it was inhabited with people and a, and a flourishing kingdom, it's, it's like a waste land, and all that's left is wild animals, uh, and and the, all the description of the beasts uh, in the rest of the chapter, uh, many of which are hard to translate, so you can come to different translations to use different uh, words in our English language to try to translate what's going on there. But all of the animals, whatever they are, are indicating a wasteland, and these are animals that dwell in and flourish in a place where there are not people. So in the judgment scenes in Isaiah, and this one in particular, is like people used to live here, but now the city, cities are empty, the fortresses are laid waste, and all that is there is all these wild animals like the hawk, the porcupine, the owl, the raven, and we'll get to hyenas and jackals and other things, too, in the next verses. Um, And notice particularly when it talks about God stretching out his line on it Mm -hmm. and the plumb line, you know, when you talk about these are carpenters' uh, tools, right? right? Plumb lines and lines. People who are building something are measuring carefully so that when they build it, everything is just so. But notice it's the reverse. 
so instead of construction, it's destruction, and you're left with tohu wavohu, the, uh, the term that you had back in Genesis when, when God was creating, uh, beginning creation, and the, the earth, earth was void and em- empty and void and vust und leer. You know, it's a, yeah, tohu wavohu is emptiness, confusion, mm-hmm. chaos, from which in Genesis, you know, God brought order out of the chaos and and created the universe in a wonderful, beautiful way. In this judgment scene, God is doing the reverse. It is the reverse of creation. It's the reverse of construction. It's destruction, the end of the world, and confusion and emptiness there, and nothing is left, and the kingdom of Edom is left uh, left without inhabitant, and a, again, a picture of utter destruction. Absolutely. So going back to the beginning, again, that there's going to come a day. I mean, maybe you have avoided it uh, and you haven't had to pay the wages of sin yet, but the day of vengeance comes. And these are very judicial kind of terms that we're looking at. This year of recompense for the cause of Zion, um, it's it's a judicial kind of court trial. When you look at, there's going to be a penalty that's going to be paid here uh, for, for what's been done. And, and that's what it means by this vengeance, is that the wage has to be paid. And as you said, here's what that wage looks like. Here's the cost. Here's the the penalty. Everything, as you said, when God gave us, you know, our cities where we had these noble leaders and a kingdom, we had prosperous lands, we had, you know, not just predators, but we had, uh, you know, other animals, and then all of it becomes desolate. You know, as you said, it goes from creation, kind of this anti-creation now. It goes from the beautiful garden to that, you know, sulfur and scorched earth of Sodom and Gomorrah and from this beautiful building up of a a city and a nation uh, to its very destruction again. But I think it's also important again when we talk about the the payment and the wage of sin, we also remember that this is another vivid reminder of why we need the Messiah. We all have to pay this wage of sin. This is the cost that everyone uh, in humanity would pay if it were not for the fact that someone else has made recompense, right? Recompense for these wages, and that is Jesus Christ. The only way that we can possibly be found not guilty and having this as being our judgment is in Christ, because as he says on the cross, he specifically uses language that says this debt has been paid in full. There, there's nothing remaining for you to pay. I have paid uh, the cost and the wage of your sin uh, in in this judgment. So, I, absolutely, I, yeah. I think uh, even though it speaks in these uh, very court-like terms and talks about the, and this is what it's actually going to look like, um, we we also remember that it points us to Christ and His sacrifice. It's what Paul means when he says, "The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord." That's law and gospel very starkly presented, as it is here. Amen. Uh, and so we'll we'll look a little bit more at the the, the wages here in verses uh, thirteen uh, through fifteen, and as it speaks again about what is going to happen on the day of judgment. It says in verse thirteen. Thorns shall grow over its strongholds, nestles and thistles in its fortresses. It shall be the haunt of jackals, an abode for ostriches, and wild animals shall meet with hyenas. The wild goat shall cry to his fellow. Indeed, there the night bird settles and finds for herself a resting place. There the owl nests and lays and hatches and gathers her young in her shadow. Indeed, there the hawks are gathered, each one with her mate. So, Pastor Worth, it begins talking about our strongholds, our fortresses, whatever we, uh, in earthly sense, uh, consider to be a stronghold and a fortress. What does that mean for us when it says the thorns will grow over the strongholds, nestles okay. and thistles in its fortresses? Well, once again, think think back to the literal situation in the days of Isaiah, when Israel's enemies and Israel itself would build forts, and you'd build high walls and fortresses with towers, and people would think, this is my stronghold, 
when the enemy comes, I'm safe because I've got this fort, this castle that will protect me. And, uh, and, and yet, literally, in those days when the enemies would come, whether it was the Assyrians or the Babylonians or whoever, and, and later in the days of Jesus, the Romans, they would come and they would knock down the walls and they would burn the city and they would take the people away as captives. And, and these uh, human-made fortresses and castles uh, were not impregnable. Mm-hmm. They were not... Uh, uh, something that you you could uh, would never s- suffer any defeat if you were inside of one. So one would have a false hope, an idolatrous trust in these man-made fortresses to protect them, uh, particularly if if people's hearts were far away from God, and God in his judgment allowed the Babylonians and the Assyrians and the Romans and other enemies to come and take over their countries. And what would happen in the end is these castles and fortresses would be knocked down, the cities would be burned, and what would happen instead when the people were hauled off as captives, thorns and thistles would grow there, and wild animals like jackals and hyenas and wild goats and so forth would come and live where the people had lived in these mighty fortresses that were not so mighty after all. Mm -hmm. That was literally so then, and here is, it certainly is a picture of all that we would trust in. So as you were indicating by your question, uh, you and I maybe don't build physical fortresses and physical castles like that anymore, but there are all kinds of things that we are tending to trust in. Our own ideas, our own learning, our own accomplishment, our own successes. Uh, in our day and age, people can trust in science. Uh, they trust in reason. They think that we have all the answers. Who needs God? Who needs God's Word? Who needs to listen to what God says? I am sufficient in my myself. Um, uh, Simon and Garfield go, you know, I've got my poetry and my books to protect me, right? Mm-hmm. So I have all these things that I can trust in and think that's, I'm safe here. And yet, when the judgment comes, if you're trusting in anything or anyone other than Jesus Christ, if you're trusting in anything or anyone other than the promised forgiveness of sins and the righteousness that comes as a gift in Jesus, then What's left is, yeah, your strongholds, your fortresses, your castles are demolished, and as is vividly portrayed in this imagery, it's like a desert where just wild animals live and, you know, your fortresses are not going to protect you if you're not trusting in in Christ to be your rock and your fortress. Right. So it's very vividly saying to us that you cannot escape God's justice. And it gives us a very clear picture of what that looks like. So as we read through this, as difficult as it is, as challenging as it is to think of God and his wrath, it is telling us that if you want the opposite of holiness, if you want the opposite of God's righteousness, if you want the opposite of God's justice, this is it. <laughs> you know, you, you will get what you have asked for. You cannot escape that Justice. If you wanted to see what the picture of this looks like, and if this is what you're asking for, this is it. It is a very, very vivid picture of this wilderness that is, um, you know, something that you cannot escape in God's justice. You can you can give it flowery language, as uh, Pastor Worth uh, started us off. You know, we can call this uh, progress or being more tolerant, um, and and that's not to say it's. Uh, you know, this is anything. This is, it could be greed, it could be uh, uh, adultery, whatever it is that is hostile to the Word of God that normalizes sins and the breaking of God's commandment. We cannot, there is no fortress other than Christ in which we can escape this justice. And if you want to see what this looks like, the opposite of God's holiness and righteousness and justice. This is the picture in Isaiah 34. As hard as it is for us to, to actually look and see what it is, this this is what God is picturing for us today. Yes, absolutely. So so with that said, uh, Pastor Worth, in the last uh, couple of verses, um, you know, and I think... Uh, for me, uh, being kind of the church planting, working in the margins in the cities and seeing a lot of these kind of desolate situations and, and the, the, the mission that is set before us, um, it, this is also a good 
reminder for us as the church that this is real stuff. This is this is the plight uh, of the nations, the people that are outside of the church. And uh, let's take a look here at verses 16 and 17 and talk a little bit more about what, what does that mean for us and in, in our witness today. So it says in verse 16, Seek and read from the book of the Lord. Not one of these shall be missing. None shall be without her mate. For the mouth of the Lord has commanded, and his spirit has gathered them. He has cast a lot for them. His hand is portioned out to them with the line. They shall possess it forever. From generation to generation, they shall dwell in it. So uh, to me, it points uh, directly from there is a prophecy and then there is a fulfillment. There is God's command for judgment, and then there is the Spirit that will fulfill it. And then the ultimate question then at the end is, what will your eternal portion be? Where will your dwelling be? And as Luther points out in the catechism, you know, this is from generation to generation. What what does this say to us, uh, Pastor Worth, about God's prophecy being fulfilled? Well, first of all, The immediate context here is the fulfillment of his threats of coming judgment, that God isn't messing around, he isn't joking, he's not pulling any punches. What God says, he will surely do. And so the judgment that befalls the unbelievers, as pictured here, is sure to come. Uh, The day of grace will come to an end, and those who spurn and reject the grace that's offered to them in the gospel of our Lord Jesus will suffer this utter destruction and terrible judgment that is described in such vivid pictures in this chapter. But at the same time, as we've been saying, the God who uh, threatens judgment and whose word uh, is calling the wicked to repentance is also the God who promised and in the fullness of time sent his son, Jesus Christ, uh, to be the redeemer of the world. And so it's this God who is speaking in these words of the prophet Isaiah, who says, seek and read from the book of the Lord. And one might ask, which book of the Lord are we talking about? And when you read the commentaries, it appears that the prophet is speaking, first of all, of his own uh, prophecy here, the prophecy of Isaiah, as we certainly have it today in, in the canonical scriptures. But certainly all of God's written word is the book of the Lord. And from Genesis to Revelation, it's got... Uh, that same message of law and gospel, repentance and forgiveness, the message of God's wrath and judgment against sin, and the promise that in Jesus there is the forgiveness of sins because the judgment that should have befallen us, uh, he took in our place. The Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all so that by his wounds we might be healed, that we might be forgiven and saved. And that's, again, this this uh, call to seek and read from the book of the Lord uh, is that we should take seriously the Word of God today while we have that opportunity. We just, uh, a week or so ago, we're celebrating the Reformation, and Jesus you know, talks about, you know, if we're his disciples, then we're going to, you know, what, dwell in his Word, right? And let his Word dwell in us richly, and we'll really be his disciples, and we'll know the truth, and the truth will set us free. The truth that sets us free is a truth that's that gospel truth about Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus, the Son of God, who loved us and gave himself for us. Jesus, who endured the wrath of God on Calvary's cross in our place, uh, as God uh, meted out uh, his judgment on all the sins of the world as they were laid on Jesus. And think about, again, even the imagery of the sun and the moon and the stars being dark. You know, on that Good Friday, it was dark at high noon, Mm as the wrath of God was poured out on Jesus, the Son of God, and he's bled and died and cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was forsaken so that we would not be forsaken. He died that we might live. He took the penalty of the law, the curse of the law for us, so that in him we might be blessed, that we might be forgiven, that we might be saved eternally. And his glorious resurrection on the third day, you know, is that wonderful vindication, is it not, that the Lord has laid in Zion this precious cornerstone, Jesus Christ, and the church is built upon him. Our faith is built upon him. And uh, so, yeah, where will our portion be? If it were based on my works, 
on on what I deserve, I would be cast out into outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. But when uh, when we are received by Jesus and by faith receive him and accept that promise of forgiveness and eternal life that only he can provide, then our portion is with the Lord, and we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. What a wonderful right. promise we have there. Yep, amen, and, and there is our sense of urgency. This is not just about nations. Uh, it's not about nationalities. Um, it is belief and unbelief. And so it is speaking of a family tree that you belong to and that we are children of Abraham by, by faith. And so when we are talking about this, this is our neighbors that live in our neighborhoods. This This is the least and the lost that live in our cities. This is our own family members that we're talking about. How will they be judged and declared not guilty? How will they not face this judgment? Uh, We as the people of God um, who have this recompense uh, from Jesus Christ also have a message to tell. As difficult as it was for us to look at this today, uh, it is a very clear and vivid picture of the day of judgment that is to come and gives us our sense of urgency to talk about this new creation that is to come, this book of life that has a name written in it in Jesus Christ. And so, again, it was a challenging uh, time for us to look at God's wrath in all of its fullness, and yet it also points us to such a great sense of urgency to reach those lost around us and to tell them this is real this is what it will look like this is the day of judgment and yet let me tell you this good news of jesus christ the one who has fully paid the cost the lamb of god who has taken away the sin of the world amen amen so pastor worth it was uh really great Uh, spending this time with you today. Thank you so much for not only clearly uh, delineating for us the law of God, but also giving us that great good news of Jesus Christ. So again, thank you, Pastor Word from Good Shepherd Lutheran Church in Arnold, Missouri. And uh, they also are our KFUO Church uh, of the Week. And again, uh, thank you to our listeners for for listening in. I know that uh, hearing about God's wrath in such a vivid, uh, R-rated even um, way is is challenging for us. But also, you know, it is very clear um, just how important it is for us as God's people not to shy away from telling people uh, the Word of God in all of its fullness, the full law and gospel. And so... uh, we just encourage you uh, to consider this uh, and those around you. Pastor Worth, any final thoughts? Any final thoughts? One minute. Uh, <laughs> okay. Once again, so so uh, I agree with you. We need to preach the full counsel of God, reach out to our friends, our neighbors, people in the city, people in rural areas, people in the suburbs. We all are sinners. We all need to hear that word of God's judgment, but also for the sake of being pointed to Christ, who bore the judgment of God for us, his life, his suffering and death, his victorious resurrection, that's where our hope is. God promises forgiveness to all who repent and believe the good news in Jesus. So we want to get that word out there. And here at Good Shepherd Lutheran Church, we invite people to come and hear us Sunday morning at 9 a.m. Sunday School and Bible Class are at 1030. This Friday, the Arnold Veterans Parade starts here at 11 a.m. So if you're in the Arnold area, you can come and participate in the Arnold Veterans Parade at 11 and also our Thanksgiving Day service will be at 10 a.m. on Thanksgiving Day. We hope people will give thanks to God for his grace and blessings in Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Worth. You're welcome. Thy Strong Word is produced by the LCMS Office of National Mission and underwritten by Lutheran Heritage Foundation. You can find them online at lhfmissions.org. I'm Pastor Steve Shave, LCMS Director of Church Planting and LCMS Director of Urban and Inner City Mission, uh, sitting in for Pastor A.J. Espinoza. And we do remember Pastor Espinoza in our prayers. I hope he's back with us soon. And thank you to all of our listeners and God's peace today. You've been listening to Thy Strong Word, produced by the Lutheran Church Missouri Senate Office of National Mission in cooperation with Worldwide KFUO, the official broadcast ministry of the LCMS. Your support is vital for this program to continue. You can make a gift safe, secure, and easily online at kfuo.org. Thank you for listening and supporting Thy Strong Word.